And a warm welcome on this chilly Melbourne evening. Um, we are here, as you know. In fact, you're here as part of this remembrance and celebration of one of the most remarkable books ever written. Um, and just before I introduce our guests, um, I would invite Tony Birch to read the traditional welcome to country. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Um, we would like to pay our respect to the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. We would like to also pay our respect to all of the elders of both of those communities, past and present. But equally, we want to pay our respect to all of the communities that you represent, your elders, and all the people that are here tonight. Thank you. Now, as I said, we know why we're here tonight, and we know what we're here to celebrate. Uh, not just one of the most loved books of all time, but, but also when a, book, uh, a book that sort of touches on some of the great themes of its time and of our times. Race, class, honour, justice, and that old perennial good parenting. <laughs> somehow Harper Lee found a way to deal with all those issues in a way which is, is inspiring and has touched us and stayed with us for so long, um, even though those words were written 50 years ago, 50 plus. Um, and what we're here to discuss tonight is do they have the same relevance and, and resonance today? But, um, but we're also here just to let it happen, to remember this great time. And this is one of the reasons I was so thrilled to come. We all know another book by the same author has come out. Um, I would say a free review. It is extraordinary. Do not be scared off by the, by the headlines. Do not be scared off. But that is not um, the point of tonight's uh, celebration because it is a chance before all that fire and thunder takes off to actually remember the beautiful, perfect thing that Harper Lee gave us. So let me introduce our guest tonight, um, who will be performing not a play, not a play, but, but an abbreviated reading <laughs> of the novel, adapted by actor, director and dramaturg Anne-Louise Sarks, currently resident director of the Belvoir. Theatre. <laughs> um, very theatrical. Um, so I'm going to introduce our guests and um, I would please, don't clap between times, we want to get to business so I'm just going to move through quickly, okay? First we have Nicola Roxon, lawyer by training. In 1998 she was elected to the Labour seat of Jellybrand and in 2011 she became Australia's first female uh, Attorney General. She's now adjunct professor at Victoria University's College of Law and Justice. Beside her is Bruce Gladwin, <coughs> Australian artist and performer, artistic director of the innovative back-to-back -back theatre since the end of last century, since <laughs> 1999. A long time. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Now, the Honourable Lex Lazary is, um, to use a formal term, he is a gun lawyer uh, who is uh, a Queen's Counsel and he is now judge for the last eight years, he was saying, has been a judge in this state's Supreme Court. Just for the bookish among us, since we are all among friends, I would say he also plays um, a role in Helen Garner's House of Grief. Oh. Um, I was wildly excited that he was going to be here tonight because I fell in love with him in that book. I'm sure many of us did. <laughs> um, but... Uh, um, in a respectful, judgy way. Yes. <laughs> That's a shame. <laughs> Tony Birch is a um, highly regarded author of both fiction and non-fiction. His latest a collection of short stories is The Promise. His new novel... Sorry, I beg your pardon. His... Yes, his latest short stories was The Promise. Um, his new novel, Ghost River, will be out later this year. He does a lot of work with young people and... I was reading the Miles Franklin site because you have been nominated for <coughs> that, and I believe you take special pressure, pleasure returning to the tool schools that expelled you um, because your books are on their syllabus. That's right. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> this is a man we want on the team. <laughs> and Virginia Gay. <laughs> Virginia Gay, performer extraordinaire. She can be on stage and telly. She can be a nurse. <laughs> She's been Julia Gillard. I have been Julia Gillard. Mm, yeah, yeah, Poppy did a better job at it. Um, <laughs> she has, sorry, sorry, in being a winner, I mean. Um, <laughs> She's played them all. Plus, 
Um, she's a dab hand at Cabaret, and she's headlined at the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, and she introduced me to a book called Cold Comfort Farm, which I love forever. And for this, I'm eternally grateful. Virginia will be reading one part only. She will be reading Scout. All the others will be reading multiple parts. So when different characters come out, just... It's deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So... Let us begin. <coughs> the, the, the format is going to be roughly um, that uh, it's been broken into five parts. At the end of each part, we'll be having a discussion about some of the issues that have arisen and, um, and getting opinions on why this book has so moved and lived with us. When he was nearly 13, my brother Jem got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the events leading to the accident. I maintained that the Yule started it all, but Jem, who was four years my senior, said it all started long before that. He said it began the summer Dill came to us. When Dill first gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. We lived on the main residential street of Maycomb County, Atticus, our father, Jem and I, plus Calpurnia, our cook. We found our father satisfactory. <laughs> he played with us, read to us, and treated us with courteous detachment. Maycomb was an old town, but it was a tired old town when I first knew it. A day was 24 hours long, but seemed longer. There was no hurry for there was nowhere to go, nothing to buy and no money to buy it with, nothing to see outside the boundaries of Maycomb County. But it was a time of vague optimism for some of the people. Maycomb County had recently been told it had nothing to fear but fear itself. Hey. Hey yourself, said Jem pleasantly. <laughs> I'm Charles Barker Harris, folks call me Dill. I can read. So what, <laughs> I said. I just thought you'd like to know I can read. You got anything that needs reading? I can do it. <laughs> How old are you? Asked Jem. Going on seven. <laughs> no wonder then. Scout's been reading ever since she was born. <laughs> and she ain't even started school yet. <laughs> the Radley house fascinated Dill. Inside the house lived a malevolent phantom. People said he existed, but Jem and I had never seen him. Jem received most of his information from Miss Stephanie Crawford, a neighbourhood scold, who said she knew the whole story. When that boy was in his teens, he took her up with some bad ones. They were arrested on charges of disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, assault and battery, and using abusive and profane language in the presence of a female. Boo Radley was released to his father, and he wasn't seen again for 15 years. Then, 15 years later, <coughs> Stephanie informed us, Boo Radley was sitting in the living room cutting some items from the Maycomb Tribune to paste into his scrapbook. As his father passed by him, Boo drove the scissors into his leg, <coughs> pulled them out, wiped them, and resumed his scrapbooking. He was 33 years old. Mr Radley declared no Radley was going to any asylum and so he was kept at home. I wonder what he looks like. Me too. Jem gave us a reasonable description of Boo. Boo is about six and a half feet tall. <laughs> he dines on raw squirrel and any cats he can catch. <laughs> There's a long jagged scar that runs across his face. His teeth are rotten and yellow. His eyes pop and he drools most of the time. <laughs> Let's try and make him come out, Dill said with a glint in his eye. I'd like to see him. Now I'm going to tell you something and tell you one time only, said Atticus sternly. Do not bother that man. But Atticus, why doesn't he want to come out? What Mr Radley does is his own business. If he wants to stay inside his own house, he has the right to stay inside. How would you like it if I barged into your rooms at night without knocking? That's different. Yeah, we're not crazy. <laughs> what, what Mr Radley does might seem peculiar to us, but it not, does not seem peculiar to him. If you can learn a simple trick, you'll get along better with all kinds of folks. Atticus paused. He made sure we were listening. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb in his skin and walk around in it.
Hey, Scout, what you got? Find its keepers. Where'd you find it, Scout? Oh, where I found the chewing gum, that old knot hole in the tree. In the Radley tree. <clears throat> What's inside the box? Two pennies, all slicked up. They're, they're real valuable. They make you have good luck. And I found these two. I held up two small images carved in soap. One was the figure of a boy, the other was in a dress. Scout, these are real good. I've never seen any miniatures this good. Jem looked from the girl doll back to me. The girl doll had bangs. So did I. Hang on, Scout. These are us. Who did them, do you reckon? The next week, the knot hole yielded a tarnished medal. But our biggest prize appeared four days later. <clears throat> it was a pocket watch that wouldn't run on a chain with an aluminium knife. I don't get it. I just don't get it. I, I don't know why, Scout. Wh why would someone leave these things in a tree? You reckon we ought to write a thank you letter to whoever's leaving these things? Next morning, on the way to school, we ran to the tree to drop off our letter. But someone had filled the knot hole with cement. For reasons unfathomable to the most experienced prophets in Maycomb County, autumn turned to winter that year. <laughs> One morning, I awoke. I looked out the window and I nearly died of fright. <clears throat> the world's ending, Atticus. Please do something. No, it's not, Scout. It's snowing. <laughs> Jem said, if we waited until it snowed some more, we could scrape it all up for a snowman. We pulled on our coats and rushed out into the street. I stuck out my tongue and I caught a fat flake. Don't eat it, Scout. You're wasting it. It's hot. <laughs> it's hot. No, it ain't. It's cold. So it burns. We walked over to our neighbour, Miss Morty's house and borrowed all her snow to make our very first snowman. Before I went to sleep that night, Atticus put more coal on the fire in my room. Atticus said it was the coldest night in his memory and that our snowman was frozen solid. Minutes later, it seemed, I was awakened by someone shaking me. Hurry, hun, said Atticus. Here's your shoes and socks. Is it morning? Stupidly, I put them on. No, it's a little after one. Just as the birds know where to go when it rains, I knew there was trouble in our street. At the front door, we saw fire spewing from Miss Morty's dining room windows. Now listen, both of you, go down and stand in front of the Radley place. Run now and Jim, take care of Scout, do you hear? We stood watching the street fill with men and cars while fire silently devoured Miss Morty's house. It was dawn before the men began to leave. Miss Morty was staring at the smoking black hole in her yard. And Atticus shook his head to tell us she did not want to talk. Then finally he led us home. I thought I told you and Jem to stay put. Why, we did, sir. We, we stayed. Then whose blanket is that? Blanket? Yes, ma'am, blanket. I looked down and I found myself wearing a brown woolen blanket around my shoulders. It isn't ours. I turned to Jem for an answer, but Jem was more bewildered than I. We didn't move an inch, Atticus. I swear. Atticus grinned slowly. Looks like all of Macon was out tonight, one way or another. We'd better keep this blanket to ourselves. Maybe someday Scout can thank him for covering her up. Thank who? Boo Radley. My stomach turned to water. Jem's eyes were wide. Just think, Scout. <clears throat> if you'd just turned around, you'd have seen him. And now you can applaud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's start with Atticus, because you are the font of all wisdom in these matters, as Atticus. <laughs> as Atticus. Um, this is the scene set, basically. It's setting up the chief characters, it's setting up the town of Maycomb, and both of which are vital, but particularly the nature of the town. Um, it feels like home, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's, it, we know that place so well. <clears throat> it does, except that I know what's coming. <laughs> um, and so, yes, it, it feels like a small town, and it... I didn't live in the 30s, wasn't that long afterwards, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, I can imagine that town as being a 1930s town in, uh, in Alabama and the US. Yeah. Um, 
fairly um, insular. Everybody knows everybody. Uh, everybody's very comfortable, uh, so long as nobody's causing any trouble. Yeah. Why do you think... Um, how would you say that, that uh, Nicola, that, that that town is created? I mean, is it, is it through incidents like, um, like the snowstorm, which is, which is, you know, bring all the fire, which brings everybody together? Or what is, it, what is the quality of that town? I don't know. I think when, uh, when I first read this as a 12 or 13-year-old or something, I totally wanted to be Scout. And I think part of the power in the way it's set up is, is you can imagine those kids and you can imagine them finding things in the tree and you can imagine them thinking the neighbours are odd and listening to the gossip. So it's, it makes you immediately relate to them. Mm. And I think it also makes you immediately have this respectful relationship with Atticus. Yes. Um, so that sets it up a bit yes. for the future as well. I mean, it also sets up that these guys um, are pretty unreliable narrators, particularly Scout. But Jem, you know, I mean, they don't really know a whole lot of things. They don't know what's going on with Blue Radley. They don't know what... Well, you don't know what snow is, Scout. Um, should we trust them? What else don't they know, Bruce? Uh, what don't they know? Well, um... <laughs> I guess uh, a big one is Boo. Like, Boo is a big unknown. And uh, he's sitting... He's, you know, part mythological, really, is kind of the way they describe him, is really like a, a kind of... Um, a, a beast that's in, a, in an enclosure that they, um, they imagine um, what he's like. And it's a classic haunted house scenario. It, it's it, a gift that there's actually someone in the haunted house. A creepy one. It's like having a real gothic haunted house just two doors down. So, yeah, it's, it, you know, I can imagine that it's terrifying for them. And then even just approaching the house is, you know, um, terrifying. To get, to get to the front porch is just really extending your, your bravery. Yeah. When did you first read the book, Tony? Um, I first read the book yes. two months ago. <laughs> Seriously. And I picked it up thinking, uh, uh, as soon as I open this up, I'll remember all of this. It'll just come flooding back. And as I got chapter in and chapter in, I went, I've never read this. This is incredible. And I can assure you that reading it for the first time as an adult is just as magical and amazing as I imagine it would have been reading it as a kid. And I, I read the final chapters in the makeup chair at work with my fist in my mouth, like just... And somebody came up to me at one point and went, Virginia, do you want a coffee? And I went, can you not see that she is... There's a thing that's happening anyway. Um, uh, so it's, it's wonderful to read it from that point of view and I see totally how it could be such a useful book for children. But I just... I think it's a terrific book for adults too. I think it's perfectly plotted. I think it's so exceptionally plotted and I think this piece actually sets up how beautifully plotted it is because at this point you go, even though you don't know it at this time, you go, ah, Boo Radley, as well as being a beast, is a kind of angel or spirit who appears when he's needed. That's, that's literally all you know at this point. And then you mostly Boo Radley is recessed to the back of the thing. This is like a perfect crime novel where you introduce a suspect and then you back them away and you introduce a whole lot of other sus suspects and foreground ideas. <laughs> it's also, Tony, the first time you hear what, what we realise is, is one of the many homilies, one of the mantras of, of um, Atticus, which is to walk, to walk in someone else's skin, yeah. to walk in their shoes. Yeah. So it's kind of a signal that this is going to be more than just an adventure story, isn't it? That there's going to be some kind of morality tale here. Yeah, look, I think the, the point about it's when you read it at different ages. So I've read the book many times and I did read it first when I was in high school and that first reading is quite different from those that came afterwards because Atticus is such a benevolent but powerful father figure in the lives of these two children and I'd never met a man like that. So the, most of the men in my life, in my family, were either dysfunctional, absent or very un you, men you couldn't trust. And that, in fact, my first reading was so fixated on Atticus, I seriously used to fantasise about Atticus being my father. I was so taken. And when I saw the film version and Gregory Peck <laughs> playing, it was even more so. <laughs> so I can't it, think why. And, and I think the point that you, you asked earlier to Jem, or Jem's namesake, was that what you don't realise, I think, on that first reading is that 
because the two children have so utter faith in their father, they are unreliable narrators to the extent they don't fully realise the flawed world that their father works and lives in, that he's, for all his wisdom and his intelligence and his benevolence, he knows the world he lives in, and, and they're shocked by that at some point. But so it, but he's the, such a powerful figure. The voices are so clever. I mean, reading it at different ages. So, you know, when I read it when I was young, I totally wanted to be Scout. And then when I read it as a law student, I totally wanted to be Atticus. Mm -hmm. And then when I read it as a parent, um, when we get to it later, you know, I'm horrified about some of his parenting. Um, <laughs> you know, some of it's so moral and so yeah. good. But it, so it's, I think it's a sign of just a brilliant writer if you can read it at different times and, and see it from those different perspectives and voices. Mm -hmm. And can I um, also just say, hearing it read as opposed to reading it oneself, it reminds you how very funny it is. It is seriously funny. It's so great. <laughs> and I think the really important thing to remember about the voice to you say, you're absolutely right about the idea of an unreliable narrator. But in that same way that Austin does with Emma, there's enough information, there's enough eyesight that you have as the reader that you see that Scout is is unreliable and you, uh, you ask yourself to think a, a couple of steps outside of Scout's worldview and that's, I think, a really exquisite piece of writing and narratorial twist to it. And the fact, of course, that Scout is writing about her past is what helps you do that, that you go, when I was a kid, you know, this is what I thought and let me use the voice of a child to explain that, but remember that I'm saying this as an adult. Mm. But at the same time, she's also the character, entirely yeah. right, as you move through the novel, who asks the questions that no one wants to be asked. Mm -hmm. So as much as she's unreliable, she's the one who puts so many other people, characters in this book on the spot with her, li her literal understanding of the world. So she doesn't understand the world politically or culturally, but she sees a, the reality of a inequality and unfairness in front of her. And so in that sense, She's a very powerful, although unreliable, mm. writer. Mm. And her unreliability is incredibly winning, isn't mm. it? Charming. Mm. Yes. Um, before we were going to resume, uh, I just wanted to ask, is there anyone encouraged by Virginia's confession that she's only read it two months ago? There's nothing wrong with that. Is there anyone here who hasn't read it? <laughs> we can't, we can't I don't see, see a single it. hand. I've never been so heartened by a lack of audience participation. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, let, us, let us continue. Great. Atticus, do you defend niggers? Don't say nigger, Scout. That's common. That's what everyone at school says. From now on, it'll be everyone, everybody less one. Well, if you don't want me to grow up talking that way, why do you send me to school? <laughs> My father looked at me mildly, amusement in his eyes. Do all lawyers defend ne negroes? Atticus? Of course they do, Scout. Well, then why did Walter say you defended niggers? You aren't old enough to understand some things yet, Scout, but there's been a lot of high talk around town that I shouldn't do much defending of Tom Robertson. But I'm going to defend that man. Well, if you shouldn't be defending him, then why are you doing it? This case, Tom Robinson's case, is something that goes to the essence of a man's conscience, Scout. I couldn't go to church and worship God if I didn't try to help that man. I couldn't hold my head up. Come here, Scout. I crawled into his lap and tucked my head under his chin. Do one thing for me, Scout, if you will. You just hold your head high and keep those fists down, no matter what anyone says. The way we conduct ourselves when the chips are down, well, all I can say is, when you and Gemma groan, maybe you'll look back on this with some compassion, some feeling that I didn't let you down. But Atticus, you must be wrong. Most folks seem to think they're right and you're wrong. They're certainly entitled to think that, and they're entitled to full respect for their opinions. But before I can live with other folks, I've got to live with myself. There's one thing that doesn't abide by a majority rule, Scout, and that's a person's conscience. Are we going to win it? No, honey. Well, then why? Simply because we were licked 100 years before we started is no reason for us not to try to win. You sound like some old Confederate veteran. Only we're, we aren't fighting Yankees. We'll be fighting our friends. But remember this, no matter how bitter things get, they're still our friends, this is still our home. So you need to keep your head, even if things turn ugly. Hey, Mrs DuBose, did you see my father shoot that rabid dog just now? He's the deadest shot in Maycomb. 
Don't you say hey to me, you ugly girl. You say, good afternoon, Mrs. Dubose. You should be in a dress, young lady. If someone doesn't change your ways, you'll grow up waiting on tables at the OK Cafe. <laughs> The OK Cafe was a dim organisation at the ed edge of town. I was terrified. Jem took my hand. Come on, Scout. Don't pay any attention. Just hold your head high and be a gentleman. Not, not only a finch waiting on tables, but one in the courthouse luring for niggers. Yes, indeed, what has this world come to when a finch goes against his raising? <clears throat> Jem was scarlet. I'd become accustomed to hearing insults aimed at Atticus, but this was the first one coming from an adult. Your father's no better than the niggers and the trash he works for. The screen door slammed and Atticus called to Jem. His voice was like the winter wind. Jem, are you responsible for the damage to Mrs. Dubose's flowers? <laughs> yes, sir. Why'd you do it? <sighs> Mrs. Dubose said you were a nigger lover. And that's why you destroyed her garden? Yes, sir. To do something like this to a sick old lady is inexcusable. You'll go around there and apologise to her at once. All he was doing was standing up for you. Never thought Jim would be the one to lose his head. I thought I'd have more trouble with you, Scout. Atticus, what exactly is a nigger lover? Atticus's face was grave. Scout, Atticus said, nigger lover is one of those terms that don't mean anything. Like snot nose. That means something to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to explain. Ignorant, trashy people use it when they think somebody's favouring Negroes over and above themselves. Well, you aren't really a nigger lover then, are you? I certainly am, and I do my best to love everybody. Baby, it's never an insult to be called a bad name. It just shows how poor that person is. Atticus, can I ask you one more thing? Atticus nodded. Why didn't you ever tell us you were the deadest shot in Macon County? <laughs> Scout, I wanted you to know what courage was. Real courage. I didn't want you to get the idea that courage was a man with a gun in his hand. <laughs> How hard is it to use, to actually say nigger? How hard is it, because it goes up against everything we know. It's just a word, but it's, uh, it's very... Did you find it difficult? I'd rather say the N-word. That would make me feel a little bit more comfortable. It feels really... It wouldn't sound very hyper either. No, I don't think it would be appropriate here, but it does feel quite uncomfortable. Yeah. I suppose the useful thing, of course, about that entire scene is that Scout doesn't know it to be a dreadful <laughs> word. I mean, she knows that it's not the greatest word in the world, but... She, again, we're talking about an unreliable narrator and about the idea of us reading this now as opposed to 1960 and 1935 when it's set. We've got layers of knowledge about how incendiary those words are and the words has, have, of course, changed. But for Scout, she recognises that that's something that she wants explored and she's trying to use the words that get the answers, sort of what you were talking about before. Mm. Like, she just asks the questions. Mm. Mm. It, it's also interesting that um, um, Funny Ray O'Connor, who dismissed the book as a, a ch children's book, used the word nigger quite liberally in her own writing, and, and she's a great writer. And when I reread the commentary about this book and thinking of O'Connor dismissing the book, I think, again, for Harper Lee to put those words into the mouth of a child when she wrote the book, it, it's uncomfortable for us now. And I, I, I think it would have caused great discomfort then, not because it was, um, whether it was given language of the 30s, that when she was writing this book, that word was very much part of public discourse about racism in America and the growing civil rights movement. Mm. So to use it in the time that she wrote the book, I think it would have caused great anxiety. <laughs> Very charged, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it is, I take the point about using the N-word, but again, when I read O'Connor in particular, to read the words, or that, that language, with characters from the South in the mm -hmm. time that she's writing, it just gives you a greater 
sense of the depth of racism that those characters are expressing. Yeah, so you need right. to hear the word. I think, I think to do other than to use that word in this context mm. in, a, in an Alabama town in the 1930s would be to deny the reality, and the reality was that this sort of racism was absolutely entrenched. It was part of everybody's life. Some people resisted it, others simply accepted it. And, you know, it's, it's taken as read... Of course, we don't use those words anymore, but it's, it's interesting, isn't it, Lex, that um, in 2015, we can't use the word, but the southern churches are burning, and they can That's shoot right. men in the back. That's right. Black the, men in the back with multiple bullets. The injustice. But we worry continues. about the word. Yeah. And I think you'd find if you went to the, those towns now even, there's plenty of people still using the word nigger. I'm surprised though. What was the phrase at the opening of the scene when Atticus said, it's trashy, it's cheap? Yeah. That you... Common. That you, common. Something. Common. That seems to be the least of the problems with that <laughs> word, doesn't it? With, through the idea of calling people niggers. But I also think it's, again, the, the device with Scout is that dawning of it being <clears throat> different if an adult is using it as a term to abuse. So yes. when, when the nasty neighbour is actually saying Atticus is a nigger lover, Scout, although she is imperfect in her understanding of other things and Jem, know that that is some more serious thing than kids in the playground doing it and that, that there's a bigger problem here, which I think is also interesting. Mm. I mean, but it also it also goes to the issue of class, which is a central issue to the book, mm -hmm. that it's interesting the way that um, racism is located. So the verbal racism is located in the poor white trash of the town who, you know, <clears> who <throat> criticise Atticus, but in the end, the, the, you know, the depth of racism in the book is in the law. It's in the, in the law that actually allows this case to progress in the way that it does. So when people can lay, lo locate racism in the verbal utterances of you know, the poor and absolve themselves, I think that's one of the real tensions in the book. But, I mean, we'll, we'll come to this more as we get to, uh, towards the court scene, but I think that this, it is really interesting, isn't it? And I think it was, it's one of the real question marks, perhaps, over the book, or maybe it's just a reflection of the times, that racism, as you say, Tony, is directly related, connected to white trash. Mm. Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, that why that would be, rather than recognising it, it crosses all classes and types. Is it just the convenient, Bruce, do you think, that, that you can um, you, you locate it with the poorer, trashier section of Maycomb? Yeah, well, I, I think that the, the reference to common, it's like your, you know, the language you're using, Scout, is like what, what the <coughs> poorer aspects of town use it. You know, it's, it's, it's not, it really identifies um, Atticus's family as sitting at, at a certain class level. It's a language is um, is a message about who we are and our position in this town. But, I mean, we're not reading, obviously, the whole book tonight. I, I think there is actually still quite a bit of... There are many occasions Atticus's own family, actually, who are clearly not the white trash, mm. but, but they are as horrified that he's defending Tom Robinson. Mm. So yeah. I think... I, I don't think it's just all the poor people think this and all the educated people think something else. I think it's more nuanced than that, it's although there is, there is still that social and class element in okay. it all, Mrs. very De strongly. Mrs has got her own problems. She's got her own problems, <laughs> but she's not regarded as the white trash. I mean, she's no. a drug addict of some type, but, um, you know, but, but she is seen as higher class, um, yeah. and Atticus isn't, doesn't dismiss her as white trash. The, look, the thing that stands out to me of the many points raised in that scene is Atticus's insistence, we won't win, we can't win. <laughs> now, he's right, as we know. We've all read the book. But um, as a lawyer, a former lawyer and now a judge, Lex, um, was, he, was there anything else he could have done? I mean, was he right to be realistic going into it? Well, <clears throat> to the extent that the story reflects um, the circumstances that prevailed in those days, of course, it's a great embarrassment to the law because uh, the issues that arose in this case had nothing to do with the law or the evidence. This was all about racism. And, um, and the law really made a fool of itself. And he, he knows that's coming because if you're black and you're charged with an offence against a white person, you're going to be found guilty. The, the level of evidence is irrelevant. And, and he, I mean, we'll come to that, as you said, but he already knows that because he knows that that's what dominates the decision-making. 
and uh, speaking as someone, and again we'll come to this in more detail, who is a great supporter of the jury system, it's an embarrassment to me. Mm. I'd forgotten the line from Atticus that the reason he shot the dog was because he wanted to show another form of of bravery, that <clears throat> courage wasn't about having your hand on a gun. It's like, he, he really sort of, Harper Lee seems to have tapped every possible um, issue, even gun control. That's I know. really impressive. <laughs> Actually, because we've got a little conversation break written after that, I was like, oh, we'll be talking gun control then. <laughs> I was like, it's not what this book is really about though, really, is it? No. But it's so incredible. Lex, you were saying before that the, the tenant, the central tenant of Atticus, is something that is true to all defence lawyers. Is this... The... You mean in their earlier conversation? <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, totally. Um, well, he, he is a lawyer who is... I mean, if you read the book, you know that he's in fact been asked by the judge in the case to take the, to take the trial on because the judge knows he'll do a proper job. Yeah. So a lawyer who is a committed defence lawyer immediately develops as part of the tools of trade an empathy for the client no matter how bad. Uh, an ability to see the circumstances and the facts from the client's point of view, that's what you have to do. And that's what, in part, he was doing in this case. He has to, I mean, th in this case, it was a lay-down mazir. Indeed, he should, as he says later, he should never have been prosecuted. But, but what he's portraying is that quality that defence lawyers have to see the case and the circumstances from their client's point of view. And if they don't have that empathy for their client's cause, they can't do their job properly. Or, or, or he's trying to be a good parent and encouraging children to be compassionate about different positions that people are in. And if you really want to understand why, you know, I don't... Uh, you know, with a legal background too, I don't think we should pretend it's... I don't think you were, but that it's only lawyers that get taught to try to have compassion and understanding for other people. It's partly why no, it's an interesting all. book as it... I wasn't saying that uh, at all. No, but, I know, but I... But I, I, I think I, he's showing that to his children mm. as an example of the way they should conduct themselves. Yeah, exactly. That was when I read it for the first time as an adult, that was the only phrase that you've got to crawl into another man's skin <laughs> and expose it. That was the only one that I... that kinged as, like this is a, a kind of morality story for children. So when you said before, this is actually the first thing that you have to do as a defence lawyer and this is something that is so important as a, as a professional, it actually allowed me to hear it again as not just a, a, a story of morality, but as like, this is actually, this is his... Mm. Which is skill, fish. it's actually a skill. Yeah, it's a skill totally. that he has learned. I mean... What's interesting to me also is that there are many such um, sores and homilies mm. and lecturings, actually, from Atticus in the book. Yeah. Tony, you work with, um, with kids who've done it tough, who are tough. I was a kid who did it tough. You were a kid who did it tough. Um, why is it that we tolerate, in fact, we admire and adore Atticus for these very things, but if our own parents said them to us, we would just be, as they say, spewing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, I, I think that, um, I mean, again, it's interesting, whether it be my personal circumstances or, say, I've, I've worked with kids in juvenile detention, it's interesting because I understand the point, but both in my case and the kids that I've worked with at the old Tirana, which I don't know if anyone here has ever been an inmate at Tirana, um, is that... <laughs> Kids actually, quite seriously, kids that live quite chaotic lives, they actually crave someone to provide order for them, to provide a sense of not, and I heard someone just say boundaries, you are right, but also about to, to give them a sense of what is right and is wrong and a sense of direction. And as much as he's a sort of idealised liberal character and there's been criticism of the book for that, I found that as a teenager reading the book, I would love a male figure in my life, a great female figure, a great mum, grandmother, sisters, aunties. I would have loved a man in my life to say, no, that is wrong, and what that person is doing is wrong. I never had a male figure who, who provided that sense of morality for me. It was just, if you get caught, deny everything. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, you, when you're working with kids in youth detention, they don't want someone to say that, because it, it didn't work. Yeah. And they want someone to give them a guiding hand. And I think that's why he's such a, a wonderful character. Yes, because it, it is easy to, to see him as almost as a bit of a plaster saint. I mean, I don't know. Oh, don't, yeah, don't absolutely. Him, but yes. it, and that's interesting because when I, when I read the book last year, which my daughter was doing it for 
um, HSC, and she was frustrated with Atticus and frustrated with the legal system that Lex has just talked about. I was finding myself trying to defend him, but as an adult, I couldn't. Mm. So that she, my daughter was very frustrated with Atticus, very frustrated, like, like Scout is when she asked, yeah, why is this happening? And I was trying to say, well, you've got to be in someone else's skin, but I wasn't really convinced as a parent. <laughs> and I must say, on a, on a very trivial level, um, the uni- a, a example of the universality of the book, when Mrs DeBose um, says that, uh, that, you know, you accuses Scout and says that you may end up waiting tables at the OK Cafe, this is in fact exactly what my mother used to say, <laughs> that you will, except you'll have to go and be a shop girl. But that was what, that was what happened to children yeah. who didn't behave and, uh, well and respect their elders. Now, we're moving into um, the third act of five, um, which starts in the Finch family home and takes us to a very dark place. One summer evening after supper, Atticus did something that surprised us. I'm going out for a while, he said. You folks will be in bed when I come back, so I'll say goodnight now. Then he left, carrying a bulb and a long extension lead. <clears throat> and he took the car. Atticus never took the car. I've got a feeling, Scout. I'm scared. Scared of what, Jim? Scared about Atticus. That somebody might hurt him. We decided immediately we should follow Atticus into town. Across the square was a solitary light burning in the distance. Atticus sat propped against the front door of the jailhouse, reading the paper. Four dusty cars came into the square, moving slowly in a line. Atticus seemed to be expecting them. He looked up, closed his paper and folded it deliberately. The men got out of their cars. We sneaked across the square. The men talked in near whispers. He in there, Mr Finch? He is, and he's asleep. You know what we want? Step aside from the door, Mr Finch. You can turn around and go home again, Walter. Won't do that. Might as well, Atticus said pleasantly. Sheriff Tate's around somewhere. The hell he is. Heck, Tate's so deep in the woods, he won't get out till morning. (laughs) Didn't think of that, did you, Mr Finch? Thought about it, but didn't believe it. Guess that changes things. Do you really think so? Do you really think so? Was a dangerous question from Atticus. I was pretty sure he was about to deal with somebody. This was too good to miss. I broke away from Jem and I ran as fast as I could over to Atticus. Hey, hey, Atticus. (laughs) I leapt triumphantly into a ring of people I'd never seen before. I looked up at Atticus, confused. A flash of fear was coming out of his eyes. Scout, Jem, what are you doing here? There was a smell of stale whiskey mixed with pig pen. Go home. Jem, take Scout and go home. Jem shook his head. Jem, I said go home. Jem shook his head again. Son, I told you. I'll send him home, a burly man said and grabbed Jem roughly by the collar. Don't you touch him. I kicked the man swiftly. I was surprised to see him fall back in real pain. That'll do, Scout. Nobody gonna do Jem that way. All right, Mr Finch, get him out of here, someone growled. You've got 15 seconds to get him out of here. Please, Jim, take them and go. No, sir. Mr Cunningham, is that you? Hey, Mr Cunningham, don't you remember me? I'm Jean Louise Finch. You brought us a big bag of turnip greens, remember? How's your entailment? (laughs) Scout. I go to school with your boy, Walter. Everyone was silent. Well, he's your boy, ain't he? Ain't he, sir? Mr Cunningham gave a faint nod. (laughs) Knew he was your boy. Maybe he told you about me because I beat him up one time, but he was real nice about it. (laughs) (laughs) Tell Tell Walter hey from me, won't you? Mr Cunningham displayed no interest in discussing his son, so I tackled his entailment once more. (laughs) Entailments are bad. (laughs) I was beginning to feel sweat gathering at the edges of my hair. I was wondering what idiocy I'd committed. The men were all looking at me. Some had their mouths half open. Atticus's mouth, even, was half open. (laughs) Atticus, I was just... 
saying to Mr. Cunningham that Mr. the entailments are bad and all that. But you said not to worry. It takes long sometimes, but that you would all write it out together. Nobody moved. What's the matter? Mr. Cunningham squatted down and took me by both shoulders. I'll tell my boy you said, hey, little lady. Let's get going, boys. Doors slammed, engines coughed, and they were gone. A soft, husky voice came from the darkness. Mr. Finch, they gone? They gone, Tom. Get some sleep. They won't bother you anymore. Suddenly, the full meaning of the night's events hit me, and I started to cry. I turned to Atticus, but Atticus had gone to the jail, and he was leaning against it with his face to the wall. Atticus, can we go home now? Atticus nodded, produced his handkerchief, gave his face a going over and blew his nose violently. Yes, Scout, looks like we can go home now. Jem frowned. I thought Mr Cunningham was a friend of ours. He still is. He just has his blind spots along with the rest of us. But he wanted to hurt you. Mr Cunningham is basically a good man. He just has his blind spots along with the rest of us. Don't call that a blind spot. He wanted to kill you. He might have hurt me a little, Atticus conceded. But son, you'll understand folks are a little better when you're older. Sorry, you'll understand folks a little better when you're older. A mob's always made up of people, no matter what. Mr Cunningham was part of a mob tonight, but he was still a man. And what you children did, you made him remember that. talk about what those children did, because I think that is one of the beautiful, beautiful moments of the book, beautifully told and written and imagined by Harper Lee. Nicola? Oh, I agree with you. I think it's, it, again, it just emphasises how clever it is in its writing. You see it through their eyes. As an adult reading it, you feel the danger and threat and don't want them there, but actually they're the circuit breaker. Um, so I, I think it's a lovely spot. I think other than, other than the, the slightly jarring, oh, you know, Mr Cunningham's part of the Ku Klux Klan and wants to kill somebody because they're black um, is just a blind spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> other than that seeming to be a massive understatement, um, <laughs> the, the scene is fantastic. Well, in fact, there's a, there was an article um, uh, written by Malcolm Gladwell um, and a couple of years ago, where he said, yeah, yeah, Mr Cunningham has a blind spot. It's just that he, he's a homicide, he has a homicidal hatred of black people. That's a blind spot. Um, is that good enough? Is Atticus's answer, first do you think, good enough? That it's a blind spot? Uh, well, you know, I think it's... Uh, Atticus has this amazing capacity to step inside, you know, literally, he says, step inside the skin of another, and I think on some level he has uh, the capacity to sit inside Mr Cunningham's skin and see, see the world from Mr Cunningham's perspective. Now, you know, I don't necessarily think that um, Atticus is making a moral and ethical kind of um, defence of that position, but he has the capacity to do that. And I think at that moment when Scout is talking to Mr Cunningham and these men, she really humanises this moment and she has... She has this capacity to, to see the other as something that is human. And mm. that's, I think, what's fundamentally really touching about this, this moment. Well, look, one of the thing, interesting things, again, it's partly the point and the criticism of the book. Strangely, it doesn't have to be good enough, I don't think, because one of the criticisms of the book would be to say, you know, where we're looking at it now, <coughs> that very question in the Gladwell essay we would ask with a lot more critical analysis of the book. So we then put the to defend the book, it'll be put into its historical time frame. But in fact, the book is timeless. And because the book is timeless, it allows you to adjust your critique of the book legitimately. So they both move forward together. So I think you can ask those hard questions of the book and it's not a judgment of the book being a bad book. It's mm. to raise questions that we can raise now that maybe it would have been raised in a different way or not raised at all previously. So again, thinking of my daughter doing the book and asking the question that you just asked, Jennifer, it would be, we can say, is it good enough? And if it's not good enough, 
a year 12 student writing an essay can write an essay about why it doesn't seem good enough. And I don't think that's, that's doing anything but justice to a book which has a set of ideas that we can look at in the 21st century from our perspective now, regardless of making a judgment in that way. And it, it could have, it had the potential otherwise also to be, um, to be too moralising. My mum's here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I think it, it also is kind of powerful because the, there's, the scene is so frightening and you feel the danger, not just for the kids, but for Atticus. And in a way, the understatement is quite a powerful thing rather than, you know, the whole, the whole lecture mm -hmm. um, that he might, you might have thought he should give as a... I don't know. So I think it is hard to interpret whether it was downplaying it or whether, mm -hmm. you know, he's a man who would have been frightened for his own life. He's suddenly frightened for his children's life. And to sort of just explain it, it yes. in that way is, is maybe enough. Lex, you can... I was just going to say, it's, I think, un totally unrealistic. Um, Atticus Finch has been asked to take on a case by a judge who thinks he'll do a good job, which he knows he's going to lose because his client is black, uh, the victim is white, and he's got no prospect of getting this man acquitted. And a day or so before the trial is due to start, a lynch mob appears. They don't even want to take the risk on the flawed system of justice by letting him go to court. They want to go into the prison, pull him out, take him out and hang him. Um, he ought to be outraged. This is no blind spot. Yes. He ought to be outraged by the very prospect um, that that was going to happen. But would you accept Tony's point, which is that, um, a bit like the use of the word nigger, you have to, you have to contextualise for the time. Would it have been understandable? Um, um, even well, that, not tolerable that, for the that time. That wasn't my point. Um, I wasn't saying it was understandable for the time. I was actually saying... Um, Lex, I think what the word you should is totally unrealistic. Unrealistic. M no, my point was more that you could ask that question of, yeah. of it. So yes. I wasn't making an excuse for it right. at the time. It would be more that you could ask the question or you could provide the critique that Lex just has and do it legitimately. I'm trying to imagine putting myself in, in that position and facing that group with their intention and then saying to uh, my children who intervened as these children did, oh, look, it was just a black spot and mm. he's not really a bad man and the system's flawed and they were going to hang him. But apart from that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> pretty good bloke, really, here in Mokum. <laughs> but it does Community also... minded. <laughs> <laughs> Dispatch it... the Negroes. <laughs> dear, oh dear. Um, it, you're playing many characters here, Lex. Many, many characters. Um, but it does also go to... I mean, I would say generally, I think there are, there are questions you could raise about um, some of Atticus's responses. Mm. But it, it is a reflection not just of the time but of the tone of the book. This is written yes. through Scout's eyes. And, and I think there is something about the gentleness of all his responses. You know, would that... All adults could be so gentle. He, and his point throughout the entire book is actually not so much about right and wrong. The thing that he keeps coming back to is this idea of compassion for other people from wherever they come from. And that involves exploring their background and where it... Where it, how he has, how it has led them here. I was thinking about that point that we were saying before about the idea that there are speeches and there is a bit of moralising. I think moralising is a bit of a strong word, but you know there are speeches in this book and there. Um, but I think the reason that kids love it is because the uh, the activity of morals is put into play in these incredible plot points. Like this is. This is actually somebody standing up for what they believe, which even though Scout doesn't even quite understand what she believes at that time, she just goes, she reads a situation and she identifies the human in another human being. And this is like this incredible template for living that I, again, I wish I had read as a kid because I would have loved to have been more like Scout as a child. I was a scaredy cat. Mm. But I think that's, that's how you can get away with the extraordinary morality of it, she sinks it in these incredible plot points. But she's going for the common thing they have. Yeah. But it is, again, the criticism that Flannery O'Connor made was sort of bringing these two points together. And to Lex's point, O'Connor would say this is a child's fantasy mm. novel. And if O'Connor had written this, you know, if, if anyone's read Flannery O'Connor, Cunningham would be evil. And there would be no redemptive possibility for a character like that. So, you know, 
she was a much darker writer in that true sense of writing that Southern Gothic. And while this book's often said it's Gothic, it's much lighter in its tone in that way. <laughs> I'd also um, like to, to, to talk just quickly about, about um, again, back to La Harper Lee's writing, because that scene, it's very hard now. We were discussing that there is only one film um, that we can think of, which is the Gregory Peck film, which I think you were saying, Virginia, was made just two years? Two years after. after. The book is 1960, the film 1962. Can you think of another film which has not been remade? Uh, I don't think there is one. Such, such was the power of that film. So it's hard to know um, which is the picture from the film and which is the mm. picture from your mm. mind's eye. But I think that just that mind's eye description of, of the lawyer um, standing there, the lights of the car coming up, the child coming into that pool of light. It's a beautifully, beautifully created scene. And I, I just love the um, scout jumping when, when Atticus says, do you really think so? And she's like, beauty, I've had that said to me so yeah, many yeah. times. You know, he's really, yeah. I know this is when you're going to get challenged. You know, yeah. and it's, it just brings it to life. That, that I think, makes it really credible, yeah. even although... Um, you know, Lex, you don't find the other stuff realistic. I think you can imagine that being a child's reaction to what they absolutely know their father mm. says yeah. in this sort of situation. Oh, I'm going to see somebody get told off. And it is a great scene in the film. And uh, Jennifer, this film must never be remade. <laughs> um, I mean, they, they remade 12 Angry Men and I think it was a disaster. The yeah. original 12 Angry Men was a spectacular film. This film would only suffer by being remade. <laughs> and you do love the courage of the kids. Yeah, I love that scene. I, I yeah, love that scene. Unrealistic, scene. maybe, but I love the scene. So cool. Well, let us, um, let's return to Maycomb County <laughs> um, and it is the day of Tom Robinson's trial. The following morning, Atticus stole, told us to stay home, and for a while, we did. <laughs> People were streaming into town like it was a Saturday. It seemed the whole county was coming in for Tom Robinson's trial. Aren't you going down to watch Miss Morty? I am not. It's morbid watching a poor devil on trial for his life. Miss Morty shook her head at the passing traffic. Look at these folks. It's like a Roman carnival. The courthouse was jam-packed with people. Scout, come on. There ain't a seat left. We'll have to stand up. We found a spot to sit up on the coloured balcony. The trial had already started. Judge Taylor sat at the bench looking like a sleepy old shark with his pilot fish writing rapidly in front of him. He cleaned his nails with a pocket knife. Sheriff Tate told the court how Bob Yule came into his office one night excited saying some nigger raped his girl. <laughs> She was pretty bruised up when I got there. She had a black eye coming. Can you tell us which eye it was? It was her right eye, Mr Finch. Sheriff Tate blinked and looked up at Tom Robinson as if something had suddenly been made plain to him. So far, things were utterly dull. Nobody had thundered. There were no arguments between opposing counsel. There was no drama. A grave disappointment to all present, it seemed. I call to the stand Robert Ewell, bo boomed a voice. Mr Ewell, tell us in your own words what happened on the day. I seen that black nigger yonder. He jabbed his thumb at Tom Robinson. I seen that nigger rutten on my May Ella. The crowd erupted. Judge Taylor banged his gavel for a full five minutes. He then instructed Mr Yule to keep his testimony within the confines of Christian English. All the while, Mr Yule sat smugly in the witness chair, mm -hmm. surveying his handiwork. Atticus waited patiently for the room to settle. Downstairs, heads turned, feet scraped the floor, and babies were shifted to shoulders. Upstairs, the Negroes whispered softly amongst themselves. Mr Yule, Atticus asked, can you read and write? I most positively can. How do you think I signed my relief checks? <laughs> Would you mind showing us? Bob Yule took out the pen with his left hand and began to scrawl <coughs> his name on a piece of paper. A voice was booming again. Mayella Yule. Mayella, will you identify the man that raped you? That's him. Tom, please stand up. Let Miss Mayella have a good look at you. Is this the man? Tom's left arm was fully 12 inches shorter than his right. 
and hung dead at his side. From as far away as the coloured balcony, you could see that his arm was of no use to him. Is this the man that raped you? It most certainly is. Atticus's next question consisted of only one word. How? Mayella raged in the witness chair. I don't know how he done it, but he done it. Why don't you tell the truth, Mayella? Did your father beat you up? Atticus had hit Mayella hard, but it gave him no pleasure to do so. The voice boomed a third time. Tom Robinson to the stand. Tom, did you rape Mayella Yule? I did not, sir. Why did you run? I was scared, sir. Why were you scared? Mr Finch, if you was black like me, you'd be scared too. Next, it was the prosecution's turn, and his tone was much rougher than Atticus's. If you had a clear conscience, boy, why were you scared? Like I says before, it weren't safe for any black man to be in a fix like that. But you weren't in a fix. You testified you're resisting her advances. Were you scared she might hurt you, a big fellow like you? No, sir. I was scared I'd be in court just like I am now. Scared you'd have to face up to what you did? No, sir. Scared I'd have to face up to what I didn't do. This was as much of, uh, as I heard of the cross-examination because Jem made me take Dill outside. For some reason, Dill had started crying and couldn't stop. By the time we got back inside, Atticus was addressing the jury. Gentlemen, this case is not a difficult one. It requires no minute sifting of complicated facts. This case is as simple as black and white. The state has not produced one iota of evidence that the crime Tom Robinson is charged with ever took place. The defendant is not guilty, but someone in this courtroom is. I have nothing but pity in my heart for my Ella Yule, but my pity does not extend to her putting a man's life at stake. She is the victim of cruel poverty and ignorance, but I cannot pity her. She is white. What did she do? She did something that our society, to our society is unspeakable. She's white. She tempted a Negro. Her father saw what happened, and what did he do? Well, we know that Mayella Yule was beaten savagely by someone who led almost exclusively with his left hand. Today, a quiet, respectable Negro man who had the unmitigated temerity to feel sorry for a white woman is on trial for his life. He's had to put his word against his two white accusers. I need not remind you of their conduct in, here in court, their cynical confidence that you gentlemen would go along with them on the assumption, on the evil assumption, that all Negroes lie, that all Negroes are basically immoral, an assumption one associates with minds of their calibre. However, you know the truth, and the truth is some Negroes lie, and some Negro men are not to be trusted around women, black or white, and so with some white men. This is a truth that applies to the entire human race and to no particular race. We're beginning to hear more and more reference to Thomas Jefferson's phrase about all men being created equal. But we know that all men are not created equal in the sense that some people would have us believe. Some men are smarter than others. Some have more opportunity because they're born with it. Some men make more money. Some ladies make better cakes. Some people are born gifted beyond the normal scope. But there's only one way in which all men are created equal. There's one human institution that makes the pauper the equal of a Rockefeller, the stupid man the equal of an Einstein. That institution, gentlemen, is a court of law. In our courts, all men are created equal. I'm no idealist to believe so firmly in the integrity of our courts and, and in the jury system. That's no ideal to me. It is a living, working reality. But a court is only as sound as its jury, and a jury is only as sound as the men who make it up. I'm confident that you gentlemen will review without passion the evidence you've heard, come to a decision and restore this defendant to his family. In the name of God, do your duty. As Atticus turned away from the jury, he said something else I did not catch. Jem, what did he say? I think he said, in the name of God, believe him. The jury never looks at a defendant, it is convicted. When this jury came in, not one of them looked at Tom Robinson. I shut my eyes. Guilty. 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 
Guilty. Guilty. Guilty. Guilty. It was Jem's turn to cry. His face was streaked with angry tears as we made our way through the cheerful crowd. It ain't right, Atticus, said Jem tearfully. No, son, it's not right. They've done it before, and they did it today, and they'll do it again. And when they do it, it seems only children weep. We walked home by Miss Mordy's. Don't fret, Jem, she said. Nothing is as bad as it seems. As I waited for the jury, I thought, Atticus Finch won't win. He can't win. But he's the only man in these parts who can keep a jury out for so long in a case like this. And I thought to myself, take note of this time and this place. It's 1935 and it's Maycomb, Alabama, and we're making a step. It's just a baby step, but it's a step. I think I'm beginning to understand something, Scout. I think I'm beginning to understand why Boo Radley stayed shut up in that house all this time. It's because he wants to stay inside. Again, great bit of writing, great structure um, to have that uh, amazing spectacle. But let me ask all of you, but particularly you, Les. I mean, Bob Ewell, he's, um, he's even more unlikable than the <laughs> unlikable Walter Cunningham. Um, and, um, and nevertheless, you know, Mayella, unlikable as she is too, she was his victim. He abused her in every way. Um, did Atticus do the right thing, basically? working for his client and traducing the woman. Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it's a killer point. It's just that it wasn't going to do any good in that case. Um, you know, he, he, um, he, um, he was basically a one-armed man. I mean, and, and that hadn't become apparent. In the film, I think there's a scene where Atticus throws something to him, a pen or something, as I recall. Uh, a glass. A glass. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And he catches it, and it's, I mean, it's very powerful because it hits you. Um, so but once you're in that situation, then, of course, she has to be lying to protect her father. But uh, he, he couldn't he have let the one arm... Um, not a complex legal point, is it? I mean, no. couldn't he have let that uh, do the argument? Did he really have to... Um, to, to, to basically traduce her to, to uh, you know, she had an itch for a Negro, as I seem to remember the actual phrase. I mean, it, but he has, she, but you have to put the circumstance. You have to to be able to explain why what happened happened, mm. and you to take out her um, taking a shine to Tom uh, and attacking him in effect, um, yeah. as he described in more detail in the book, um, is to remove an important part of the evidence and a, an important part of the explanation. In the film and in the book, he gives evidence and he describes as he goes back to, to uh, break up the kindling uh, what she actually does. That's a very important part of the, yeah. of the case. And uh, to simply rely on the fact that he was effectively a one-armed man wouldn't have been enough. Uh, there's a line where they say, you know, he's a strong man, maybe he could do it with one arm. But I think this is interesting because, as I distinctly remember reading this as a young person so, being so swept up in the injustice to the, uh, to the blacks and Atticus's fight, I don't think I really even focused on... She's um, a victim of domestic the, the, violence, well, yes. It, absolutely abuse. not. But also, it wasn't really until reading some of the critiques in preparation for this where one of the commentators, might have even been Gladwell, but says, um, really, Atticus is not fighting the good fight here. He's asking the jury to swap one of their biases against black people for another bias, which is women are always asking for it. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't, I, the power of the rest of it didn't make me think about that. Um, but reading some of the other materials, and particularly in America, and I, you would hope here now, when it's taught, that that would also be part of the discussion. But I'm not sure it jumps out to you when you read it as a young person. Um, and I'm a bit ashamed to say that, actually, but I think the, the writing is so complex and there are so many different issues that you could pick up, and I think this is one that maybe is a bit overlooked in the way we make Atticus a hero, because it doesn't really fit with him being a hero. And not suggesting that you are anything but entirely youthful, Nicola. The fact is, <laughs> I mean, really, domestic violence... It was violence more has, than 30 years ago, has so a, you're no, kind, but, but, but yeah. domestic violence has not 
really was not discussed until, I mean, in fact, even the existence of it. Mm. Um, Domestic violence and sexual abuse. There's a one line in the entire courtroom scene where somebody says it's no worse than what her dad does to her. Mm. There is another issue that mm. I think that is overlooked, and that is it might be deeply psychological around the writing. I mean, culturally, in the sense of uh, to deal with racism, the greatest threat in the United States is, is the black male. That's why so many black men suffer so much violence at the hands of police in, in the US and are imprisoned at such rates. But I think there's something interesting and, for me, worrying about the fact that for Tom not to be the rapist, it's not just a device about whether he's left-handed or right. He's lesser of a man. He's, a, he's crippled. And I think that it doesn't come out so consciously, but there is the fact that this black man isn't capable of rape because he's not fully a man. And mm. I think, for me, that says something which is not maybe at the conscious level of the book, but which is about the way that black men are portrayed in the US. Mm. Um, one, we, we hear from um, Miss Morty at the end, that rather portentous um, declaration that um, uh, the disaster for Tom is a baby step. It's a, um, what do you think she means by that, a baby step? A baby well, step towards think, what? I, I was think. just pleased I got to play yeah. a nice woman character yeah. instead of all the awful ones in the book, but, yeah. <laughs> Isn't Miss Morty... I think Miss Morty is one of the greatest characters in the book. I love her. She's so modern for her time. You know, she's a woman living by herself. And I have this fantasy when I read it. I was like, Miss Morty and Atticus. <laughs> <laughs> That's happening in my head. I really... <laughs> I just think they're such terrific people and they share similar views. I figure, you know, they have tea together. <laughs> they eat her lane cake. <laughs> do they, in the later book, do they get together? The I'm book? not saying. <laughs> it would be... Could be wrong. <laughs> could be wrong. Um, but, I mean, I, I, I just... I don't remember that when I... And I've read the book several times. Yeah. Quite, I don't remember that sort of... It's a baby step. But, but it refers to... His, he's made the jury think. Yeah. I, I, I can tell you, I, uh, without disclosing any further detail, I can remember completing a trial once and I was the jury had just gone out into the jury room and I was in the process of giving my details to the judge's associate. So 10 or 15 minutes later, they knocked and came back with a verdict of guilty. Uh, I didn't even have time for a coffee. Uh -huh. So to... There are cases where it's a triumph to keep the jury out of the courtroom for a few hours. At least they're thinking about something you said to them, and that's that's the baby step. And, and it I wasn't think, a formality. You know, he's yeah. black. He's guilty. Right. Yeah. Um, they actually I, thought about and it. And I think it's powerful because the discussion we were having before, um, where we were saying, or others were saying, the law lets them down. The law, you know, is the problem here. A actually, the jury lets them down yeah. as well, probably more so. more so. And so I think her comments about it being a baby step is very much about the jury and that the community has to change its views, not the law could work, the structure could work if the jury were more fair mm. uh, or were, were less racist and it wasn't all white men and all those sorts of things. Mm. So I, th I think that's what she's pointing to. Mm -hmm. And in the book, Jem makes the observation, two observations. First of all, that if there'd been no jury, the judge would have said not guilty because it was so obvious. And so, secondly, let's abolish the jury system. <laughs> and that, that was his answer. Let's get rid of really? juries because they can't be trusted. But Lex, as lawyers, how would you contextualise baby steps in relationship to, say, the Rodney King beating or issues today where white policemen have been found not guilty for killing black men when there's overwhelming evidence of a crime being committed? So is that... what? How are they... Are they backward steps or have we come not as far as people would like to hope with a book like this? Uh, I suspect we haven't come as far as people would like to hope, unfortunately, despite the amount of time that's passed. I think that's what, yeah, what, what drew my attention to the baby steps. I thought, very, very baby. Mm -hmm. Yes, a long way to go. Um, I mean, I, I, because we've only got about a quarter of an hour and we go back to going to our last section and we obviously want to talk at the end of... I'll, I'll move forward, but I would just point out, um, again, the, the, the role I think we all notice played by, you know, the poor white trash. The, um, the relief check is a nice crack. Yes. But it's a crack. Yes. Um, and, and uh, you know, the smell of pig pen. I mean, it's just... Yeah. It, Cheap whiskey. The poor white trash does not come out no. well. They're an easy victim here. 
Um, so anyway, let's, let's return uh, for the final section. Um, uh, when Atticus, when Atticus um, has things to say about Mayella, and um, of course we have the great set piece, the pageant. I'm sure we all remember that. <laughs> this is your moment. The next morning, our back step was loaded with enough food to bury our family. Where did all this food come from? It's their way of saying thank you, Scout, <laughs> to show us they appreciate what Atticus has done. Atticus's eyes filled with tears. He did not speak for a moment, and he turned to Calpurnia. Tell them, tell them I'm very grateful. Tell them they must never do this again. Times are too hard. Miss Stephanie Crawford rushed over that afternoon to bring us the latest news. She was trembling with excitement. There's danger a coming. She said that Bob Ewell stopped Atticus on the post office corner, spat in his face, and told him he'd get, he'd get him if it took him the rest of his life. I wish Bob Ewell wouldn't chew tobacco, was all Atticus said about him. <laughs> that night, Jem told Atticus we were worried for him. Jem, see if you can stand in Bob Ewell's shoes in a minute. I destroyed his last shred of credibility at that trial. The man had to have some kind of comeback. His kind always does. So if spitting in my face and threatening me, save my yellow, you're one extra beating, that's something I'll gladly take. Things did settle down, as Atticus said they would. My teacher, Miss Grace Merriweather, composed an original pageant about <laughs> Maycomb County called Ad Astra Per Aspera, to the stars through difficulties. I was to play a ham. <laughs> Someone would be dressed up to look like a cow and another child would be a peanut. When Miss Grace Merriweather called out, pork, I was to make my entrance. <laughs> we made my costume with some chicken wire and some painted brown cloth. Jem said I looked exactly like a ham. <laughs> with legs. <laughs> The night of the pageant, I waited patiently backstage for my cue. <laughs> Miss Merriweather settled into her lecture on the history of Maycomb County. 20 minutes in, I discovered if I bent my knees, I could tuck them inside my costume and sit. <laughs> After 30 minutes, I sat down and I promptly fell asleep. <laughs> Miss Merriweather was putting her all into the grand finale. In my dream, someone was calling, Pork. <laughs> I woke up startled and I made a sudden entrance. Everyone was cheering. <laughs> Miss Merriweather seemed to have a hit, but she caught me backstage and told me I had ruined her pageant. <laughs> How Jem could tell I was feeling bad under my costume, I do not know, but he told me I did all right. Jem was becoming almost as good as Atticus at making you feel right when things were wrong. I kept my costume on for the walk home so I could hide my mortification under it. We started home. It was black dark. Jem thought he heard something, and so he stopped for a moment to listen. I reached out for Jem and whispered, Jem, are you afraid? Not too far to the oak tree now, Scout. Reckon we ought to sing, Jem? No, Scout. Be real quiet. We stopped again. Can you hear that shuffling? I could. Run, Scout, run, run! But I tripped. Jim, help me! Something crushed the chicken wire around me. Metal zipped on metal. I smelt stale whiskey. More scuffling, and there, then there came a dull crunching sound, and Jem screamed. Mr. Finch said, Sheriff Tate, let me tell you what I found under the oak tree first. I found some funny looking pieces of muddy coloured cloth. Oh, that's my ham costume, Mr. Tate. <laughs> Atticus fetched the remains of my costume and showed it, and showed it to Sheriff Tate. It was crushed to a pulp. This thing probably saved her life. Mr Tate paused. He took a long breath. And Bob Yule's lying on the ground under that tree down yonder with a kitchen knife stuck up under his ribs. He's dead, Mr Finch. Somehow I could think of nothing but Mr Yule saying he'd get Atticus if it took him the rest of his life. Mr Yule almost got him. And it was the last thing he did. Scout, can you tell us what you remember? Mr Ewell was trying to squeeze me to death, I reckon. 
Then somebody yanked Mr. Ewell down. Who was it? Well, he can tell you his name. I turned and I pointed to the man standing in the corner of the room. There he is, Mr. Tate. His lips parted into a timid smile. And our neighbour's image blurred with my sudden tears. <clears throat> hey, boo. Mr. Arthur, honey, Jean Louise, this is Mr. Arthur Radley. I believe he already knows you. If Atticus could blandly introduce me to Boo Radley at a time like this, well, that was Atticus. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Finch, Bob Yule fell on his knife. He killed himself. No, Sheriff, nobody's hushing this up. I don't live that way. Nobody's going to hush anything up, Sheriff Tate said stolidly. Heck, if this thing's hushed up, it'll be a denial to Jim and Scout of the way that I've tried, tried to raise them. Atticus, listen to me. Scout is eight years old. She was too scared to know exactly what went on. You'd be surprised, said Atticus grimly. I won't have it, Atticus said softly. God damn it, I'm not thinking of Jem. It ain't your decision. It's all mine. It's my decision and my responsibility. To my way of thinking, Mr Finch, taking the one man who's gone, done you in this town a great service, and dragging him with all his shy ways into the limelight, to me, that's a sin. Atticus sat looking at the floor for a long time. Scout, he said, Mr Yule fell on his knife. Can you possibly understand? Atticus looked like he needed cheering up. I ran to him and hugged him and kissed him with all my might. Yes, sir, I understand, I reassured him. Mr. Tate is right. What do you mean? Well, it'd sort of be like shooting a mockingbird, wouldn't it? Atticus put his face in my hair and rubbed it. He turned to Boo. Thank you for my children, Arthur. Will you take me home? He almost whispered it like a child afraid of the dark. Mr. Arthur, bend down your arm here, like that. Yeah, that's right, sir. I slipped my hand into the crook of his arm, just like a lady would. Boo and I walked across the street and up the, streets, up the steps to his porch. His fingers found the doorknob. He gently released my hand, <coughs> opened the door and went inside. And I never saw him again. Neighbours bring food with death and flowers with sickness and little things in between. Boo was our neighbour. He gave us two soap dolls, a broken watch, a pair of good luck pennies, and our lives. We had given him nothing, and it made me sad. I turned to go home. Street lights winked all the way to town. I had never seen our neighbourhood from this angle. I stopped. In my mind, the night faded. It was daytime and the neighbourhood was busy. It was summertime. A man waved and two children raced each other down the sidewalk to him. It was still summertime and his children played in the yard with their friend, enacting a strange little drama of their own invention. It was fall and his children stopped at an oak tree, delighted, puzzled, apprehensive. Winter and his children shivered at the front gate, silhouetted against a blazing house. Winter and the man walked into a street, dropped his glasses and shot a dog. Summer and he watched his children's heart break. Autumn again and one black night, Boo's children needed him. Atticus was right. He said, you never really know a man until you stand in his shoes and walk around in them. Just standing on the Radley porch that night was enough. Atticus? Boo was real nice. Most people are, Scout, when you finally see them. That's it. <laughs> Let's talk Boo. Let's talk Boo. Um, he, he is really there at the beginning and the end. Mm. Doesn't play much of a role, but... But he's a magnificent creation. Tony, why don't you talk, as you said, he's kind of your favourite character in the whole book. Oh, he's... I mean, he's a lifelong favourite character of mine. Um, I mean, again, when I first read the no novel, as a child, and whether you're as unreliable or as innocent in some ways as the children are, I, I just thought it was so unfair the way he was treated and he's such an endearing character. 
But I think as a universal character, and again, a character who, who has as much relevance today, is that most of my own writing is dealing with outsiders and dealing with people on the margins of society who are either forced to the edges of society through circumstances or estrange themselves from society that they can't cope with. And um, when I write fiction, I, I tend to be drawn to compose similar characters and to put a spotlight on them in a way that, in a sense, says, well, if they have flaws, they only have the flaws that we have mm. and they have as much to that we should value in them. And I, I suppose I got... I was very fortunate to get a remarkable life lesson. Um, there's a project that runs out of St Kilda Library, a wonderful project with the city of Port Phillip called Rumours, which is about creative writing classes for people who are either homeless or living in rooming houses. And these people live a very marginal existence. Some of them have financial issues, some have mental issues. But in working with those people for many years, the thing that you find out very quickly when you listen to them talk or when you read their writing is that for many of us, we aren't more than a couple of paychecks away from being in very difficult circumstances. So there are many people, if they lose their job, you know, within weeks people could find themselves in very destitute circumstances. <laughs> or someone has lost a loved one or the death of a child is common where the mental breakdown of that places people in circumstances that we would you know, think, oh, there's something wrong with that person. So for me, he's a character who epitomises people who we push to the periphery or people who, for one of circumstances, no longer feel mm. part of society. But what you're saying about that point, which is that you're drawn to outsiders because they offer a unique perspective. When you write, you're drawn to outsiders because they offer a unique perspective on a society. That's the amazing thing about Boo, that he is almost the omnipresent mm. I in that he... He's across everything that happens in that town and he appears as the avenging angel of justice when justice itself is, is unable to be fulfilled. So he starts as this beast and he ends up as this angel, you know, and he has to exist. I, lo I love that, the reality of, like, how, how this character has come to be there, but he also exists in this ghostly other world where he swoops in at the right time and he knows everything, mm. even while he is totally removed from from that society. Lex, any any um, qualms as a um, as a legal man about <laughs> the decision to let blue let blue walk? So No um, no. <laughs> no no. I mean the <laughs> No no. Um, ends just Bob, you means. got what was coming to me. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I don't know about your principles, but your heart's no. good. Well, it's just between you and I. Really. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I think, you know, again, it's, it's one of those moments in the film. I think we can all remember when, when I think he's, he's in the corner of the room, yeah. the door swings yeah. away, and this albino, albino mm. this little... Pale. It's a great moment, mm. isn't it? And it's Robert Duval. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Mm. Nicola? Do you well, have an emotional I, response to Boo? No, my emotional response, which I completely didn't have the other couple of times I read the book, <laughs> I had this time, I, now, I have a ten-year-old daughter, and, you know, I think I just thought Atticus was so fantastic, and my reaction this time was, was what was he thinking not going to the concert? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and, Obviously, the whole story would have been different, but I couldn't get over the fact he stayed at home because he was a bit tired. And so <laughs> Scout was a bit miffed about this, and I, I just couldn't get I couldn't get over that this time. So. <laughs> I must say, it's a lovely um, the the you did it beautifully, um, Virginia slash Scout. But but um, it's a lovely example of how uh, again back to Harper Lee's writing that she she pairs moments of high drama with moments of comedy. So in the in the first scene, we have the the, the the, the snowstorm and, and the lovely um, banter between the, whether it's cold or hot, um, and which goes into the drama of the fire. Yeah. And, and we have that great pageantry which goes straight into the drama so, into, into of the night. An attempted murder and an actual murder. Yeah, it's incredible. Mm. She's beautifully controlled. Well, it's self-defence. Exactly. <laughs> it fell on his knife. 
You heard it. Lex said it. <laughs> Lawful justification or excuse. <laughs> um, you were talking before, mm. Virginia, about the way um, the Boo moves. I mean, he moves from the, the phantom monster yeah. into being the hero in a, yeah. in a way. Um, but Scout moves. Um, that voice at the end, we don't know how many years ahead um, she is when she wrote that, when she's looking back at the mm. passing of the seasons. And I know, we're all a bit sort of, yes, yeah. I know, I feel the same. It's a bit, it's, it's very, very moving. But I, I think everyone has moved, but particularly Scar. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's clearly, it's her journey into into a more complex adult world, the story of Scout in this, in this story. I, I always burst into tears at the bit where he says, where Atticus says, thank you for my children. Mm. I just, oh, my God. Um, because I should have been at the concert. Yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uncomfortable. This is why she was Attorney General. Yes. <laughs> Determination. <laughs> I, I may have missed the odd concert myself. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> and when you're talking about the great, the, the beautiful placement side by side of, of a high drama and high comedy and how they work to, you know, excel and, and show each other off. At the same time, you've got that beautiful, uh, expressive stuff at the end of the book, which is so beautiful and poetic. And then those two words, hey, boo, that just reveal everything. They cover so much ground dramatically. They are so character right. They're so moving and they make you get goosebumps. They, and you don't need a big, you know, descriptive paragraph of like, my feelings about Boo. Were, you yeah. know, like that's also exquisite. That's also exquisite writing. And my great mm. fear about Watchmen is that because it's a, a draft and because it, it's been published unedited, that it won't have that extraordinary precision. It won't have the way every single sentence just seems absolutely perfect. And there's, you know, there are about six adverbs in the entire book, and she yes. earns them. It's, you know, it is as clean as a whistle. That uh, to, to to kill a mockingbird is absolutely beautifully, yeah. beautifully clean. Um, who who is the mockingbird? I, I always thought it was Tom Robinson, mm. but... I but think there's two. It's Boo, yeah. There's Boo and yeah. Tom. Boo and Tom. And, you know, interesting, they're both disabled. Um, oh, yeah. And, and cool. you know, Tom has the arm that's gone into the shredding machine and he's lost his arm. And Boo, you know, what what is Boo's disability? It's a bit unknown. He's possibly got, like, a dual disability. One is that of some sort of uh, intellectual disability that has caused the issues for him when he was young in the first place. And then... This kind of, I imagine, like a mental health issue that has come from being locked in the house all this time. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely read it as both of them as the Mockingbird. Mm. And he's sort of a more universal character because you don't actually know. Um, you know, you only have all the unreliable, not just seen through the eyes of the children, but all the gossips who, you know, remember various bits of the story. So he becomes the outsider figure or a figure mm. with some disability that's indeterminate, which means you can imagine him having more mm. but, you know, the more people being in that position. The horror of rereading it as an adult, and that, again going to when you read it, and we talked about it out back more than here, is to think, well, the, the, the young woman who was raped and abused by her father, her circumstances don't change at all. And I'd never obviously been aware of that as a kid, but as I've read it as an adult, that's shocking. The circumstances of her existence are, are shocking, mm. and in a way, she is killed. So she could stand for that mockingbird as much as these two male yes. characters. Yeah. I, think. I, I also find when Scout says that she never sees Boo again, incredibly sad. Mm. Like that, he's in in some ways his circumstance, mm. although that he's gone through this situation of kind of high drama and met the kids that he's been looking at all his, you know, all of their lives, mm. then he just walks into the house and she says, and, and then that was the only time I ever saw him. So he sad. He doesn't make a comeback, does he, Jennifer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, actually, this, but I could, the, the tragedy is Boo does not reappear. Mm. Wow. He, we literally, not only scout, we never meet him again. Mm. Boo is the chimera. He has come and he is gone yeah. and we never know quite what he means. I mean, I agree. I think there are two milking birds, at least. And um, um, we, he can stand for anything we want him to stand for. What does he stand for for you, Virginia? Boo. As I said, I feel like he is 
he is the enactor of justice when justice cannot be done through its its proper channels. Mm. He is the true heart and soul of the, and in fact, a more modern community and I, maybe. And the fact that it comes from a, a disabled person in whatever spectrum that is, is, I think, a wonderful hope for our future mm. and outsider. Yes. Lex, do you have a final comment on... Oh, I simply <laughs> say again, Bob, you all got what was coming to him. And... <laughs> And Tremendous! It wasn't an accident then. You really do that. God, Nina. who was walking around out there in the dark, um, <laughs> protecting those children? And uh, I, I mean, seriously, I, I agree. He is the, in a sense, the avenging angel, and he made up for where justice failed. I, I agree with that. Well, if they had I a mean, decent he, father, he'd have he been was, at the concert. <laughs> yes, well, that's right. That's right. And you know, I mean, he, what, he didn't commit an offence. He, he, he was defending um, the children, obviously. So uh, there was no murder involved. <laughs> Right. Whether Atticus could have got him off, bearing in mind his record in relation to Tom Robinson. <laughs> 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 but, but Boo is also... I, I mean, for me, I thought he's the important coming-of-age... He, he enables the coming-of-age story. He's the one that enables Scout to finally understand what um, Atticus has been talking about, about standing in somebody else's shoes. Mm. You know, that that isn't just something that you're trying to do to to be in Tom's position or somebody else's. but So I think he, be he becomes the tool that allows it to be a real coming-of-age story for her. Mm. And I think what's really growing up, Growing up story. Sorry, yeah, totally. No, totally. Up. Because I think that's... If you're talking about this as a book for kids, that transition from something that you laugh at because you don't understand to something that is important and true and complex and comes with all of its own strengths and weaknesses, that is, I think, the major shift that you go through in your teenage years, really, right? From going, you're different from us, to, oh, we're all a bit different, aren't we? Yeah, well, maybe <laughs> you want to be friends? You know? Like, that's... Yeah. that's if, Again, if you're talking about this book for children, that's, I think, really important. Well, it is. I mean, it's an extraordinary book precisely because it's often been commented. You know, it is a book that is for children, that is for every age. Um, and um, I, you can read it... <laughs> at the, the, the genius age of seven, like Dill, um, when, when he's reading, um, but you can read it all your life. And I certainly have. I, I imagine many are you, of you are here tonight precisely because you have been too. Um, and uh, as I said, the, we thought it was the only one. We thought that she was kind of the great one book wonder of our uh, era, but, but there is a second one, and I think it's wonderful that uh, the Wheeler Centre have decided to mark um, the arrival of Ghost Setter Watchmen with a, a commemoration and celebration, like I said, of, 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 this, of this fantastic book, because whether or not um, you read or like Go Set a Watchman. It has actually been edited a bit, but it's much more long-winded. You were right about that. Um, but it is, it, is, it is a very different book. It's an adult book, not a children's book, um, which, which um, travels both sides uh, into an adult book. But um, I think it's uh, fascinating. I think you learn some things you don't want to know and many things um, that will enrich and change your perception. But the truth is... Whether you read it or not, whether you like it or not, nothing will change the fact that we love this book. And I don't know if you read, I, um, I saw the overnight when they were released, because they were a bit behind us, it came out here yesterday, as you'd know. Um, but they had some wonderful, amazing images that came in from Monroeville, where it's very easy to think, you know, it's, she's not loved in her own town. But, People, all these people were lined up till midnight to wait for the books to arrive and they were so proud of her mm. um, and they were writing notes because they don't get to see her either um, and saying, it's fantastic what you've done. So I would like to say thank you so much. It's been a great joy for me to hear these um, excellent readers, these excellent people reading the wonderful books. So will you please thank Nicola, Bruce, Lex, Tony and Virginia. for Jennifer. <laughs>Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. 